Hi, everyone. We'll get started in about one minute. Okay, a warm welcome to our audience, a happy Earth Week, and thank you for joining this conversation on material sustainability. I'm Mandy Mooney, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. And on behalf of all of us at the SAC and our technology partner, HIG, we're really pleased to be co-hosting this event and bringing expert voices from across the industry together to talk about the opportunities and the challenges in understanding and improving material impacts. This is a broad area and by the outpouring of interest and attendance today, we know we've hit on a timely and important topic. Addressing material sustainability is complex. We, we wanted to bring together some expert perspectives from our panelists to the forefront as they discuss the best way forward when it's difficult to measure impacts at a global scale and how this affects global supply chain decisions. During today's conversation, you'll learn how the systems in place today impact suppliers and brands how they're making the decisions and some of the challenges they face. We're grateful to have fashion journalist Alden Wicker here leading and moderating this open conversation with a panel of industry leaders and experts. Alden is a freelance journalist and sustainable fashion expert who has written investigative pieces and deep dives on innovation, materials, and consumer trends for the New York Times, Vogue, Wired, The Cut, Vox, Vogue Business, and more. Her goal is to find the science-based truth about the impact of the global fashion industry. She's also cited in the New York Times as being the first journalist to discover and report that fashion is not the second most polluting industry after oil. It is maybe the third most polluting industry. You can read more about that in Alden's recent article on her blog, EcoCult at EcoCult.com. That's E-C-O-C-U-L-T.com. After today's panel discussion, we'll close the event with about 20 minutes of a Q&A session. We received many questions from you, which was great, but in the interest of time, we've selected a variety of pre-submitted questions to cover a wide range of topics. So thank you so much for submitting your questions. And with that, welcome Alden and to our panelists. Alden, I'll hand things over to you to introduce our panelists and begin the conversation. Thank you so much, Mandy. I'm really excited to have access to all of these experts and uh, professionals in the sustainable fashion uh, sphere. So um, yeah, so I uh, wanted to introduce everybody that we have here today. Um, and also I am excited that I got to see everybody's Q and A's that came in um, and not just the pre-selected ones. So I'm really excited to see, there's definitely some trends in there. And so we're gonna get to those, but um, let me start by introducing Larray Pepper, who is the CEO and co-founder of Textile Exchange. Larray Pepper is, um, is a fifth generation farmer and her unique perspective helps her lead Textile Exchange's climate plus strategy to increase the adoption of preferred fibers. Welcome Larray. And I also am gonna ask everybody just to tell us a, a quick icebreaker question, which is where are you planning on traveling first as soon as it's safe to do so? Well, that's a lovely question. I think I probably have several on the list, but 
I'm going to have to go with Dublin, Ireland for our conference in November <laughs> would be the place to be. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, so uh, next, I'm going to pull it over to Cash East. Um, he is a longtime sustainability expert with HIG, uh, technical analyst and strategist with over 12 years of experience in the environmental industry. As a director of analytics for HIG, he designs and builds the technical underpinnings for its sustainability software solutions. Cash is responsible for implementing the data and methodology to ensure that companies have robust, accurate, and actionable results. And I know we definitely have some questions coming in about the uh, accurate and robust portion of the HIG data. So I'm gonna put those to you later. Welcome Cash, where are you mm -hmm. planning on traveling first? Yeah, so thank you. Glad glad to be here and look forward to those questions. Um, yeah, we are we are hoping to make it down to down to Mexico for uh, a beach trip this summer. Possibly that's that's the first one we have on our list. Yeah, it's uh, Mexico is a place that welcomes uh, Americans right now. <laughs> so Jeremy, um, Jeremy Lardo, Sustainable Apparel Coalition. He is a VP of the Hig Index at the SAC as part of the leadership team. He oversees the strategic direction and development of the Hig Index suite of tools. Before joining the SAC team, Jeremy was Senior Director of Sustainability Analytics at Nike, where, uh, where he led sustainability reporting, performance management, data products, and reporting. So lots of experience to share. Hi, Elden. Uh, is that my cue for my next country of visit once the um, uh, it is safe to do so? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to have to answer Mexico as well, uh, just like Cash. Uh, I have a long time, long uh, love story with Mexico, and uh, I can't wait to return. And so uh, that will be my first trip for sure. Yeah, so Mexico is pretty great. And uh, Jesse Daystar of Cotton Inc. or Cotton Incorporated. Uh, he's the Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President of Sustainability at Cotton Incorporated and an adjunct professor at the Duke Nicholas School of the Environment. Dr. Daystar leads the, the cotton industry to a more regenerative and sustainable future through supporting research and outreach programs aimed at implementing best science and practices in the soil and throughout the supply chain. Welcome, Jesse. Where are you headed next? Hey, it's great to be here, everyone. Um, that's a good question. I think first I'm going to do some mountain biking through the United States this summer and then probably have dinner and a good conference with Lore over in Dublin, Ireland come this fall. Great. I'm looking forward to when we can all sort of gather again and just have casual chats. So that'll be really great. Um, and Krishna, Krishna Manda, senior manager of sustainability integration at Lensing. Krishna is a senior executive with 15 years of experience and co-leads global sustainability at the Lensing Group. He is responsible for sustainability strategy, governance, and engagements to help orchestrate transformational change. Krishna contributes to many important multi-stakeholder initiatives to bring systemic change at scale, most likely too many to list here. Krishna, where are you calling in from and where are you going next? Uh, I'm calling from Austria. Um, thanks for having me and I'm very much excited to be part of this conversation. So I am from India. I would love to go back to uh, my home country mm -hmm. and visit my family and friends, hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, Brad Boren, Director of Innovation and Sustainability at Nerona. Brad has worked at Nerona for over 20 years. He also sits on Nerona's 1% for Nature Guidance Committee, which provides financial support towards positive change. Brad is the chair of the Textile Exchange, Textile Exchange's Biosynthetic Work Group, which I will ask you to define later, and is on the Hague Product Tools Strategic Council. He also represents Nerona with Fashion for Good and the Swedish Textile Initiative for Climate Action. Um, that's a lot of work that you're doing, Brad. I don't know how you time, find time to do it all. Um, so where are you going next? Uh, well, we're a little slow with the vaccinations in Norway, so uh, not sure. It might be Dublin if we're lucky. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, we have Helen Valen uh, from Solomon. Uh, footwear materials development team. She is in charge of implementing the HIG index and developing environmental sustainability efforts at Salomon Footwear, including adhering to develop, 
Developing Government Reporting Standards. Welcome, Helen. Where are you headed next? So I guess I have also uh, to answer to where should I where should I go um, as soon as it's possible. Uh, I think we would go to the Canary Island because that's where we were supposed to go before the pandemic started. So yeah, looking forward to go there. <laughs> Thank you everyone for humoring me. And so um, before we get started, I just wanna set the scene here for the importance of material selection um, when it comes to shrinking the fashion industry's carbon or a, uh, greenhouse gas emissions footprint. So um, Jeremy, estimates vary, but a lot of research has settled on the fashion industry being responsible for, for about 5% of global carbon emissions, if that sounds right. So do you know um, how much of that is related to material manufacture? And this one's yeah, for Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, Alden, um, good question. So uh, depending on how you slice the data, right, uh, you'll, you'll see varying figures, but um, typically we'll say between 60 to 80% of the carbon footprint of the industry lies in the um, extraction and processing and manufacturing of the materials. Uh, so it is a considerable part of the uh, carbon footprint of the industry for sure. Yeah, so it's something very important to address. Um, so it's been a, a huge week for capsule collections. Um, as a journalist, I get a lot of pitches for special Earth Week collections from lots of brands that I have heard of and some of that I haven't. So this actually is something for the group. Anybody who wants to jump in here, do you think that capsule collections are useful for reducing the emissions footprint of a brand or a product? Um, and uh, do you think they have their place um, at this point, at this stage in the sustainable fashion game? Yeah, I can answer on this one if possible. Uh, so yeah, I think that um, it's impacting to, actually impacting to have a capsule for collection because you're going to need the same amount of uh, energy and you're going to use the same amount of water to produce uh, lower quantities. So I'm not sure it's really, um, it's really useful to have a, a capsule collection. And this is uh, also maybe a reason why um, suppliers are reasonably uh, raising their, their prices when we order uh, quantities which are below uh, their minimum of quantities. So I'm not sure the, the capsule collection is really useful today. Yeah, well, I can also maybe chime in. I think uh, capsule collect, it depends what you define it as, first of all, but I mean, if it's just to show you're doing something good, you know, maybe you should do more good with everything. So I think that's one thing. Uh, but we do have a program called the ACE where we say it doesn't matter how much it costs, we'll develop something really innovative uh, and then we'll put it into it. So if we can help an innovator start with uh, a new material, a new feedstock and put that into a program and it's kind of a test program. So maybe we limit it to 500 pieces you know, that's a cool thing. So I, I think it depends how you do it and what's the reason for it. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So making sure that if you are testing out something that the hope is that you scale it up. Um, you know, we see a lot of capsule collections that are just um, organic t-shirts. So maybe not so innovative. Um, so this next question is for... Um, Actually, again, for uh, Jeremy, um, we're at a point where both consumers and governments are asking brands to say why their materials are more sustainable than the status quo. So can you explain to us um, where the EU and other governments currently are in requiring environmental footprint reporting? Sure, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated landscape. Um, there are, uh, significant uh, uh, initiatives at the European Commission level to uh, do a bit of a you know crackdown on environmental or sustain sustainability claims at large in the EU markets. Um, there are two key initiatives. Uh, one is called the Green Claims Initiative, uh, specifically looking at 
any kind of claim that revolves around the um, environmental impact as a, like a footprint calculation, right? So that um, those are made with a consistent, robust uh, methodology that is aligned upon and that, you know, there isn't sort of shortcuts made on the quality of the data or, or on the specificity of the methodology. So that's the green claims thing. Think about like carbon footprints uh, will uh, likely have to follow this kind of um, methodology set by the European Commission under this green claims umbrella. The second one is empowering consumers. Um, that's another initiative led by the Euro European Commission that looks at a broader set of sustainability type claims and uh, making sure that consumers um, uh, can trust and rely upon a consistent comparable set of sustainability claims, which is not the case today, right? Today, I think you see a bit of the Wild West when it comes to sustainability claims um, and, uh, and uh, the European Commission wanting to, to put some boundaries on all of that. So th that's a bit of the landscape and typically uh, the, the uh, uh, member states uh, align with their European uh, directives on that. Although some countries have gone a little bit ahead um, of where the European Commission at, is at, creating obviously some complexities for the brands retailers wanting to operate in those countries um, and at the EU level and trying to uh, meet the, the different uh, uh, regulations. But, but overall, I would say we're, we're at a point where um, uh, one, it's a bit of a wild west and, and there's some inconsistencies and in how things are done. And the, but the general idea that the regulations always come back to is um, creating claims that are not misleading, that can be substantiated. Um, and that's sort of the spirit of all of this, um, um, generally speaking, both in the US and the EU. And before I, I know Helen has some things to add on this, but before we, uh, before I put it to Helen, do, is there any sort of like timeline on, on when these things are really going to be put in place and become a requirement? Um, there are, although uh, these timelines tend to sometimes slip, but uh, the European Commission has set some timelines. I think June is the time frame for uh, a first implementation of the Green Claims uh, uh, Directive, but I, I'm not quite sure of the, all the details, but I think uh, uh, one of the key milestones for the European Commission is coming up in June. But no, none of this, by the way, is going to be mandatory, regulated, sort of um, environmental footprint um, uh, in the EU, for example. This is, this is still very much uh, on the sort of voluntary side. Hmm, okay. And I do want to oh. come back to that later. Um, Helen, you, uh, in your work for Solomon, you are dealing with a lot of these um, different reporting uh, paradigms. So how, how is that for you? Do they line up generally with each other, sort of the countries that have gone ahead of the EU? And um, how, do you, how do you deal with those? Yeah. So, so actually to come back on, on what Jeremy said, so we're a French brand so, and, so, and we're selling internationally. So we're, we have to fit with uh, French legislation. So on the one hand, we have to fit with the with the AJEC law, with the, which is a, a law which is related to cir circular economics and uh, and waste, in which we can find uh, Article 15, which is in which um, which talks about um, environmental display, which will be mandatory in 2023, um, and it, they are in France is studying uh, two main impacts, such as greenhouse gases and and uh, eutrophizations. So this is the French part. And the, on the other part, we have uh, the performance environmental footprint, which is a European initiative. Um, and uh, the target of, uh, of the PEF is to find a common way for companies to measure their environmental performance. Uh, and they're studying 16 environmental impact. Um, and it will, uh, to come back on what Jeremy said, it's gonna be, actually uh, probably mandatory starting uh, June 20, 2022, but I'm not sure. Um, and yeah, and we and the question we have is, is there gonna be an alignment between the PEF and, uh, and the AJEC law? Um, will the Higgins I tool will be able to support us um, to respond to the PEF requirements, but also to the to the AJEC requirements. So that's part of the question and the big concerns we have today. 
And so just to just to go back, so the the law that you're talking about in France, it you said it has to do with waste and eutrophication, so water pollution. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Well, actually, today they're they're studying uh, they're studying greenhouse gas emissions and the eutrophizations. Uh, but they're not studying the other uh, environmental impact, to, to my knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but, um, but it would be the two main impacts on which we would have to communicate starting 2023. Okay, yeah, and it, I suppose it would be really important that they all align because yeah. you, know, you can get very different results depending on how you measure and what you measure. Sure, sure. We, we have um, uh, key points where we need to know uh, which database uh, uh, the PEF is using, uh, the database that HIGMSI is using, and also the, the calculation method that both are using mm -hmm. that today are not matching uh, uh, perfectly. Okay, and so yeah, I do want to get into that, those calculations and measurements. So um, let's talk about, um, Larray, I wanted, today we're, we're going to mainly focus on climate impacts of materials, but I just wanted to know that in your work, um, how often do you find that materials with maybe a smaller climate impact, fewer emissions associated with them, with it, might have a larger water or chemistry footprint? And how do you tend to balance these different com competing concerns? That's interesting because you have to take the holistic approach. So part of the way we look at things is we're looking for best in class. We're not, you know, we're not having one material compete against another material. It's about moving all the materials along this continuum of continuous improvement and the potential they have. I'll take wool, for example, or some of the other animal fibers while they um, can have you know, they've had a history of maybe overgrazing or degradation of soils and things like that. There's huge potential in the for the natural fibers, whether that's cotton and cultivated or the animal fibers, to really make a difference in regenerative practices when it comes to soil biodiversity. So as far as the ripple effect, when you think about, well, that's only one lamb, but, he, you know, he's on five acres or 10 acres or whatever the case may be, or they're herding and grazing and it's supporting indigenous cultures. So it really doesn't matter what percentage that is, we're taking that holistic approach to move everything along that continuum because there's huge impacts can be realized even into the positive side with the implementation of regenerative soil practices and really doing the plus on the biodiversity piece. So it really doesn't matter how small or large, the principles apply of reducing greenhouse gases and increasing more sustainable, responsible, regenerative organic production systems across that portfolio. And for synthetics, it's really simple. It's about recycling. That's really interesting, and I, I do want to I do want to put a, a point on this because um, there's been you know I've gotten pitches uh, before the Hig Index did away with the unified score that took all of these different concerns and put them into one score that you could sort of compare. I would get pitches from um, organizations saying you know according to the Hig Index like alpaca is the second worst you know, material and silk is the worst material. Yeah. We should all switch to um, their synthetic replacements. Um, do you, like, how did you, I'm sure you saw some of that discussion. Like, of how course. Did you to that? Of course. And that's where we really came in that we're looking for best in class because we wear different materials for different functions. You know, I wear wool socks and I wear cotton shirts and I sleep on cotton. Um, I have an alpaca shawl. Um, I actually have some alpaca socks, you know, and so it's, it's one of those things where all the different fibers have different functions. And so a lot of the synthetics are very performance it's based. Um, and we have to look at the whole picture. The beautiful thing about LCAs is they, they do give us that snapshot and a point of reference. The bad thing about LCAs is that they don't encompass like things like microfiber and end of life. And so for every fiber, you really have to take that holistic perspective and, and look at the full life cycle of that and including, you know, because acrylic you know, fluff may be a great fake fur, but it's not warm. It has a lot of microfiber pollution. So I'm not going to have fake fur, you know, in my wardrobe. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going to have real wool and, and real things like that. But it's, it's interesting. And that's a philosophical approach. Other people may have a different perspective on animal fibers. So we want to take that into consideration. So we're really going with science-based information and evidence on impacts that these materials are making. And from where we are, let's make a positive step in a direction of travel to more regenerative and sustainable organic principles. 
Yeah. I mean, again, this is a personal opinion, but you can pry my mom's old fur coats from my dead cold fingers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're warm. They serve yeah. a function. Um, and I do have- at the end of the day, they're biodegradable. They're not going to leave uh, some of the pollution in the landfills and other places. Yeah, absolutely. And I did want to put this to the group. I mean, how do you approach these yet unquantified issues that she just talked about? Biodegradability, microplastics, microfibers, um, consumer use, right? How long a consumer will use a certain product, animal welfare, um, preserving traditional textiles and crafts. Who wants to take this I can, one? I can jump in. Um... Yeah, so I think, you know, at, at the, the heart of the MSI and the heart of what we're trying to do is develop a, a data-driven approach. And, you know, we bring in um, scientific impact methodologies and we match those up with data. So when we're watching things like microfiber pollution, which is, you know, a relatively new impact that people are tracking, um, you know, the science has to catch up to it. And we have to, you know, sort of carefully integrate all of that data into our framework, you know, uh, as was noted before, um, LCA really tries to um, create this, this consistent look at all of the different impacts. And so it's really important that we have that strong scientific basis and that we're continuing to evolve the tool. And this is not just for new impact categories, this is for existing impact categories too. And that's, that's really how the tool improves. Um, so certainly you know, better and more comprehensive data, um, but also working within these data exchange mechanisms and making sure that people are understanding data as it's passed back and forth along the supply chain. And then as it's, as it's eventually aggregated. So um, you know, the MSI is certainly a, a, a living um, database and, and you know, our, our user interactions are one of the, one of the strong points. Um, we get data from all over the world, from all, all kinds of different sources. Um, and that includes you know, impact for production, uh, data for impacts um, on production, as well as data on, on some of these new impact categories that we're starting to track. So it's really a, you know, a continuous improvement uh, and, a, and a constant quest to, to keep making the data more robust. Yeah, and this is uh, Jesse. I'd like yeah, to. So I just, I. If I, if I may, um, add Go. to that, please. Uh, so you mentioned that you know this is an ever evolving area, and it and it really is. Um, you know, I did my PhD research in the evolution of LCA and how we actually interpret the results. So uh, every day there's new research coming out, whether it be around microplastics and microfiber biodegradation. We're actually heavily involved in that research and helping create actual life cycle assessment metrics that can describe microfiber pollution. So it's, it's really changing through time. And it is really important to be at the front of the science, understand where the tools all are, adopt the new methodologies. And the Higg Index has done that a lot. And also really understand what life cycle assessments and environmental metrics are good for and what they're not good for, and make sure that we use them within the bounds that they're designed to be used in. For example, uh, I helped do the cotton life cycle assessment, and it's not designed to be compared against other studies. It is primarily designed so that we can identify what are the levers within our cotton clothing, meaning how can we reduce our climate impacts? What, what's major contributors? Washing and drying is a major contributor. Spinning and dyeing and finishing in terms of energy and greenhouse gases, major contributor to that impact. And with on the farming area, nitrogen is a big contributor to climate change. So that identifies what levers we have to push. And then we can work with programs such as the US Cotton Trust Protocol or BCI or other preferred fibers to really make change on the farm, quantify those changes, and overall move the average of a great number of growers. So it's important to remember the context of what are these studies designed for? Are they designed to compare? Maybe, but most of the time, ours, for example, is not. So make sure that we don't go beyond what the good science actually allows us to and always try to push that science forward where we can. You know, I think that's really interesting that you're saying that because, you know, I think a lot of designers, um, people who work at brands were, are hoping to use the HIG tool to identify this or that fiber, right? I mean, just from a really basic perspective, you know, should I source American cotton, Australian cotton, Indian cotton? Um, and then we, we don't we don't really have visibility because these are sort of global averages down to the to the farm, right? Um, so how do we like how are our brands allowed to use it in that way? And will they get a good answer, right? Should I get my leather from Brazil or should I get it from you know the United States? Um, these are questions that I think people are asking. Yeah, that's certainly a reasonable um, question to be asking when you think about cotton. 
A lot of times, though, there's uh, it, it's challenging to source from a particular region uh, for a number of reasons. It's a commodity, and you usually source cotton on a, a quality basis, and you might require to pull cotton from several different regions. And we think about the uh, global average uh, of cotton, when you say, if you were to compare United States versus say India or China, there's more differences from Texas to, to Georgia, two different areas in the United States, as there's more differences between those areas than there is between say China and, and India or China and the United States. So there's, it's highly regional and, and it's really challenging to source from that level of a spatial area. So I think that it is really challenging and can we really be, do that as a designer, sometimes maybe. And then also too, uh, I think it's important to remember that there's a lot of uncertainty around these models, uh, just weather and just growing conditions, but then also the life cycle system models, uh, there's uncertainty and we don't always know um, if one area is better than the other. And I think what we do know is when we engage with programs such as US Cotton Trust Protocol, Better Cotton Initiative and other preferred fiber programs, we do know that we can have an impact on the ground help people's lives, help their livelihood, and reduce environmental impacts. Using LCA as a tool or life cycle assessment as a tool to source, it's really challenging to prove benefits of actually doing that. We need to more engage on the ground. Well, here's my question is, uh, so for, for natural fibers, for farm-based fibers, you know, there's, like you said, there's a lot of different variables that go into it. So does the LCA system end up favoring uh, manufactured fibers because you, you know how they're made, you know, polyester is made pretty similarly from place to place. I mean, I mean, the only other thing is like, you know, where the energy is coming from to power the factory. You have yeah. these new innovative fabrics coming out and textiles coming out where, you know, as a journalist, I'm always saying like, oh, so your, your fabric is more sustainable. Okay, so prove it. Do you have an LCA? And a lot of times they say, they say no. So what, why, you know, where is this tension coming from between like, please prove it and we don't have the LCA or we don't think the LCA should be used in that, in that way. Well, to, to remind everybody, life cycle assessment is a holistic approach at measuring uh, sustainability metrics, and it's a tool. It's not the only tool. It does not consider social sustainability, economic sustainability. So when we're talking sustainability, we need to not only look at life cycle assessment. That being said, I, I'm an LCA person. I really think it is a useful tool when used in context. And to prove or compare fiber versus fiber, it's a quite resource intensive process to create a comparative life cycle assessment. This can be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of research in over years of actually doing the work. So it's very challenging, particularly for some of these startups and whatnot. So it, it's, it's really hard to actually get this work done. And then there's uncertainty. And oftentimes there's trade-offs, maybe as you mentioned early on where uh, might be, for example, cotton is generally better on greenhouse gas emissions, but it's going to use a little bit more water. So there's yeah. going to be trade-offs. And I don't think there is one silver bullet sustainable. It is well, I'm going to stop you there because I think uh, other people might have something to add on the topic of sure. the LCA. Um, maybe Krishna, actually, I would like to hear your experience with LCAs as someone who's working on some of these manufactured materials that are purported to be more sustainable. Yeah, I mean, LCA is definitely one of the um, ways to actually capture what are the impacts in a material value chain. However, as others pointed out, um, it is one of the tools. And, and when we make decisions, when we look at really environmental impact is one of them. And then you need to look at the social aspects. You need to look at the animal welfare and those kind of things. So I think um, within the limitations we have in terms of science, development of the science, um, uh, I think the impact categories like land use and biodiversity haven't been actually mature enough to be adapted into our systems like MSI so far. And it's also same for other life cycle assessment tools as well. So um, even uh, companies like Lensing, we are also using um, uh, the same uh, kind of methodology as MSI uh, has been uh, um, like unfounded on. So um, there are definitely advantages to understand where we stand in terms of the impacts with, where science is very mature enough, for example, climate change. It's very clear where are the impacts of the hotspots of your production and where you can actually improve. And also for water scarcity and those kind of things also, there is so much 
uh, consensus and, and there is a lot of improvement. But if you talk about toxicity or chemicals or, or land use and biodiversity and microfibers and those kind of things, I think we need to use a multi-criteria analysis kind of objective way of um, kind of uh, making the decisions. Apart from the, I know functionality is the biggest thing that we need to consider apart from all these things. So yeah, I'm just trying to reiterate what other people have said, but we are also looking at with the same lens because you don't have a perfect, uh, there is no perfect tool and there is no perfect database. Uh, we are actually making use of the, the best uh, information we have in the in the in the world and still developing ourselves and not to say that we are the best fiber i mean it's it's actually in its class maybe it's the best fiber but it's not across all fibers i think that's what we all want to agree that there is a functionality specific to each fiber type and we need to make sure that we actually choose the best one and improve the best ones even further on the line of uh, net zero and in the long run and all those kind of thinking yeah, thank you for that. Um, okay, so we could keep talking about LCAs, but I actually want to go back to um, a really important question, which is, okay, so so brands, uh, they're trying to source the best, the most sustainable version of the materials that have been specified in the tech pack from the designers. So who is typically making these sourcing materials and how do we incentivize them to make, to switch to these better or more sustainable materials. Um, anybody can take this question because I want to hear it from all different places. I'll start. You know, bottom line, it's really interesting. We did a survey across our membership and all of them would switch immediately to more preferred fibers, just like this. Uh, but it can't get past their CFO. Uh, so interestingly enough, I don't care what preferred fiber you're looking at, whether it's preferred man-made cellulosic or more responsible wool or, you know, more responsibly grown cotton. I don't care what fiber it is, recycled, whatever the case may be. These preferred materials cost more. There's investments being made. So we need to shift from the price paradigm to the value paradigm. So when you, it, when you talk to those designers, it's great. They come up with great ideas, but so many of them don't get them past you know, their CFO and into the business model. So the real barrier to growth here, we can grow it, but I can't grow it on a maybe. I have to grow it with market access and market commitment. And the same is true for every preferred material. And so it's really interesting that the business world seems to be stuck on the current price paradigm. And, you know, it's the current price paradigm that's created the pollution and the poverty and the problems. And so we've really, the big nut to crack here, the big lever to pull here is price. And so it is about, that's why a lot of the brands do capsule collections or micro collections or this because they're subsidizing, quite frankly, that collection, or maybe they charge more for that collection, but they don't have a holistic strategy to take it to 100%. And so this is going to be a big evolution uh, over the next 10 years to hit these targets of whether we can break from the price paradigm to the value paradigm. And so it's going to be, yeah, that's where, that's where the lever has to be pulled. And that means you have to engage consumers and convey and convey the value too. So yeah, it's going yeah, to be. Well, let's, let's talk about that consumer thing, because, you know, if a survey after survey comes out saying, and consumers say, oh yes, absolutely. I will 100% pay more for sustainable fashion. And I want to ask Helen and Brad, do you find that to be true? Okay, yeah, yeah, I go ahead. Um, so um, I don't think uh, we need to, to to pay today to have a more sustainable materials. I think that there are so many materials existing today. Um, I think that we the, the first thing to do is really to make an LCA on the upcoming materials. There are so many of it. Uh, I'm thinking about the 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 bio base. Uh, the biofabricates, etc. There are so much that today they are not scored. So I think that we should first do analysis and analysis of, of these uh, these kinds of materials. Um, but then once this is done, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question because I think that uh, in a, a topic world, if uh, if there there could be an organization uh, organization that could uh, search for. Uh, less impacting materials. Uh, I think that this could be a good good initiative because uh, the main the main idea here is, is to find uh, to find materials with less uh, less impact on the on the environment. And today, uh, how does it work? Um, companies produce 
materials and then they do the the ELCA. But we, we should we should reverse this way of producing, uh, of, of processing. Sorry, we should first uh, think about the the LCA and then produce the material. Uh, I think this is a and and yeah and and who who will pay afterwards? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> who will pay for that? I don't know. And well, that that will be I, the I main thing. I want to ask Brad. You know, in your experience, have you found that consumers will uh, pay more for fashion that is marketed or described or certified? as a more sustainable option? I mean, I think it, <laughs> overall price is still important in the huge, in larger market. Um, what we've seen is if we can have a durable product and we can show that people actually get the value for that product, you know, over time we repair our products. We've been doing it since 1929. So all of a sudden the price becomes a little less important because they can use it for many, many years. So design it in a way where they can use it for many years. And that's the other thing with a lot of these, some of the preferred fibers, like when we shifted to recycled, we have to do a lot of in-house testing because we know a lot of the mechanical recycled fibers are weaker. So if you wanna make a more sustainable product, you can't lose that durability in order for the feedstock to be kind of environmental. So again, looking at a holistic picture and how do you measure that in numbers? It's really difficult. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, hopefully the product module will help when we get uh, beyond just looking at, you know, feedstocks and fiber construction and material construction. So I'd say that today the consumers don't know, the, you know, enough and they hear a lot of stories and then it's very confusing for them. Oh, this is sustainable. This is, they don't get it. Uh, and there's understandable uh, reasons for that. I mean, it's complicated. Uh, so I, I think that the pricing is still really important uh, and we need to move away from even, yes, you can use this product for six months and then recycle it and that's a good sustainable story. You know, it isn't a good sustainable story. So we have to kind of get to that point where we're looking much more holistic. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like it's about it's about providing value to the consumer beyond sort of a hazy. This does good somewhere out there. And uh, Jeremy, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I think I think I mean there's what in our research and um, research that I, I've seen from others. There's there's clearly this intention behavior gap, right? Where if you ask someone point blank, like, are you you know are you willing to you know pay more for more sustainable garments, they'll typically say, yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, consumers purchase in, you know, very different sort of behavior patterns than, uh, than what they, uh, the logic that they go through in answering the questions on the survey. Um, and so at the bottom line is, um, I think that um, ultimately these capsule collections or charging more for a more sustainable uh, product, et cetera, is, is not going to work from a, from a consumer and a, and a sort of consumerism perspective. And that's just a, the, the society that we live in, right? Where you might be building the most durable products, the, the marketing gurus out there will make it so that in two, three, six months from now, the consumer is going to want to buy another product um, and and uh, most consumers are just going to be uh, uh, prone to that because that's that's what marketing does and so I think that um, we can't look at it just from the side of uh, developing products uh, uh, options that are more pricey and more sustainable because that's always going to remain a niche in the global markets like we like what we're seeing today and there needs to be some level of top down, top down mandates around the adoption of more sustainable practices throughout the supply chain, right? Otherwise, this whole thing's not gonna work and scale to the levels that we need by, you know, the science-based target that we have looks at a 2030 perspective for deep, deep decarbonization, right? 45%, I think was the yeah, goal. Yeah, 45%, absolute. And if you're looking at the business growth of most of the brands and manufacturers on, in the industry, you know, they all have positive growth projections, which means a much greater per unit reduction of carbon emissions, right? You're in the 70 or 80% range, which we're not going to solve with the materials of today. We're not going to solve with like, you know, slightly more expensive and slightly lower margin products or 
or we're not going to solve by consumers going out and making somewhat more responsible decisions, even, even with this like intention, intention behavior gap. Like there's something fundamentally bigger at play here that is going to need to come. Uh, otherwise, um, I don't see yeah. it. I would like to chime in to uh, Jeremy's point. I mean, actually, the, the whole discussion is great in this point because as Lorey mentioned about the paradigm shift, at the same time, Jeremy mentioned what is the current situation today. So we are not going to have the same type of materials for a net zero world, right? That means we need to scale up the process and develop new products and those. Where is the drive going to come from if we are not willing to pay anything for for something more innovative today. So I believe the paradigm also should come from how do we define innovation? So far, like if it's a new product type or a new technology and people are actually willing to pay, right? So are we actually doing the same service for sustainable materials as our sustainable products with more actually lower impacts on those? For example, Levi's jeans, I mean, 501 um, with very, very low carbon and, and uh, water footprint. If it can be seen as an innovation from the sustainability point of view and there is a need for it and then we slowly grow those kind of niche products to become mainstream i think that's where um, the new product development and new innovations happen in the future without changing our mindset or the paradigm of innovation defined as not only new things but also sustainable uh, improvements and and the second point what jeremy said is about the consumer attitude and how we are actually being it's a kind of addiction we have to be honest we are all part of that. There is no um, going out of that. However, there is only one way to get out of that. The, the top down is maybe from the regulation. So I believe some of the things that are happening in the European Commission or, or, the, or the regulations, which are talking about creating incentives to create the sustainable marketplace. I think without having those kind of positive and negative things on the, depending on whether you are on the sustainable side or the polluting side, I think we cannot change simply the consumer behavior and expect that companies can produce with lots of uh, millions of um, investment. So the paradigm shift on the business side to define what is innovation and on the uh, regulatory side on how to create incentives to make it more mainstream. We both, we need to tackle from both angles, I guess. Yeah. Wow, this yeah, is a huge, just... uh, I'm so sorry, but I just wanna mark this moment because I don't think we would be having this particular conversation just two years ago. This is a significant like difference from a few years ago when everyone was like, no, 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 we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Just give us some time. Just give us some time. And now we have people saying like, that's, it's not going to work. Um, so Brad, please. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, in Norway where I am, uh, we're an oil producing country, obviously, but we also have over 50% of the new cars are electric, you know, uh, government incentive can do a lot of things. And we see that, uh, you know, the highest uh, per capita electric car use, and it's all because of government incentives, take away the taxes on electric cars and people are buying electric cars. So we see there has to be a mix. We within the industry, I think we also want change and we wanna drive the change, uh, but we also have to do it in a way that's not gonna cost the consumer a lot of extra money. So we need to actually take responsibility. We can't drive it and wait for the customer to tell us we need to actually take that responsibility and look for the innovative fibers and feedstocks and see how can they actually help us improve our products. So instead of making sacrifices on new materials, we're able to develop from scratch and actually we can develop things that, that are gonna be really cool. So, I mean, I think we're in a point right now that it's extremely innovative and extremely cool. And we see these innovations just start in pilot programs now. Yeah, it's a really, I mean, it, it is a very exciting time. And um, I, everyone beat me to my question about whether this will happen without government in, intervention. So I actually want to um, talk about, let's see, um, you know, Krisha, actually, I want to go back to you. So, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about LCAs, and I want to ask you something a little bit more specific. So, you know, viscose and lyocell are, are made from plant inputs, trees mostly, um, but some of the biggest climate impacts come from deforestation, um, some of which, which has been attributed to the global viscose industry. So can you tell me a little bit about how lensing manages and measures um, like the full impact of the full climate impact of production? So not just, you know, the factory, but sort of, uh, you know, we were talking about how like 
is land use included in some of these um, calculations of the impact of a fiber? Excellent question. Actually, uh, this is one of the most important things for lensing. If you look at our materiality, like, for example, what are the most important topics you wanted to manage in the company? The first and foremost comes is like wood and bulb sourcing, sustainable aspects, right? So if you, it all depends on what are your sourcing practices? We have maybe, I don't know whether we are the first, but at least we have for last two and a half decades, a, a very ambitious sourcing policy on wood and pulp. So we are actually sourcing from only certified and controlled sources. That means we actually don't go into areas where there is a critical um, uh, kind of endangered and, and those kind of forests. So we are only sourcing from places where we are comfortable with in terms of regulation is being respected and implemented at the same time the forests are actually growing sustainably in the last few decades so if you look at central europe there is more than two and a half centuries of forestry practices with sustainability and, and those aspects so we actually source from these areas and also we are sourcing from areas where there is fsc certification has been implemented and and there is um uh, there is no danger or no critical sources coming so in a life cycle thinking perspective we need to definitely look into the sourcing of these um where they are coming from what are the challenges there and are they being actually proven by third parties because you never know until somebody is actually looking deep into that right so we are actually paying to be honest extra for all these things to be sustainable and we need to do that that's why lore is mentioning if you don't want it to um, uh, i mean if you want to improve you have to invest and sustainability is a big investment but it is the right investment and this is the only way you can make sure that um, you will have less uh, challenges in the future and it actually um, makes you future proof for the risks and growth and everything so yeah uh so i want to switch gears a little bit because we have 10 minutes left before the q a and there's a couple really big topics I want to make sure we cover. So this one's for Lorraine, actually. Um, so you said for synthetics, the story is recycled, uh, which is great. I see tons of uh, performance products made with recycled polyester, but unfortunately, all of them seem to be made from PET bottles or old carpets or uh, old fishing nets. So how, how far are we from actually seeing clothing to clothing a recycling and and um, how are we going to get there? There's some big initiatives going on accelerating circularity. One of them in our home and hospitality group, we're working with them on like all you know when you think of a hotel, there's all those re the polyester tablecloths and lots of cotton sheets and towels. And so it is a, you know we're gonna it's. And the other thing about recycling and collection, it is going to have to be region specific. And so there are some countries in Europe that have put in the mechanisms for uh, collection of, of recycled. We've got several of our brands and retailers that have take back programs. And so these are going, it's, it, it's not like you can pass like one big piece and it's done. It's going to be region by region, step by step, brand by brand in order to do that. So it's about, um, because there's not that many systems that are in that ability to take back those tablecloths or those sheets and towels. Uh, but the mechanisms now are starting to be there. And it is about setting up those initiatives, setting up the mechanisms. And so um, we have a, about 2,400 people involved in our round tables. And that's one of the big things they're working on right now is how to implement, you know, those recycle plates because it's gonna happen, it's happening in wool. It's not just in one fiber, it's, it's um, all across the board with the fibers, uh, but it's certainly got to move beyond. That's going to be a big challenge. The availability of fiber and the availability of materials uh, to get to these recycled places, like for cotton, you know, you can switch cotton from this type of production to a more responsible and regenerative, but it's like, where is the fiber that comes from, you know, getting these synthetics into a recycled system? So the good news is there's dozens of initiatives, many regions, especially the, in Europe is very uh, much more ahead of this than in America, but it is going to have to be a region by region solution. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, please. Sorry, C can I actually chime in? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I think just to add on to Loria, so we have a some big blocks for actually making the closed loop recycling of textile, post-consumer textiles. 
Uh, definitely the infrastructure that Luria mentioned about. Um, the most important thing is we don't have collection system in a way that, um, that the material can be used later because you might be storing, but it may be contaminated and you cannot actually recycle if it is contaminated. And then next stage is actually sorting. We don't have automated sorting machines for recycling purpose. And they are done for reuse most of the times. And even there are no sorting standards to categorize products into different materials, and then you can match, maybe use them for recycling at a bigger scale. And, and these why, are the things- This is why Larray was saying that their project is focused on these hotel textiles because you get 300 pure polyester, we know what it is right. type stuff. Yeah, the blend, yeah, everything have, else is yeah. a blend. It's gonna be go, that means you have to go to chemical recycling which is yeah. going to have higher costs associated with that. So it comes back in. If we want to take all the blends of things that we wear, it's going to have to be a different type of uh, recycled solutions. And, and just one addition to that exactly, like if we wanted to really go into that system, we also need to maybe look into design for circularity and recycling as well, because it's not just one silver bullet. There are several things which we have mentioned together. So I think we need to look from all these angles and there are no recycling technologies which are mature enough to do that without other changes. So I think it's, it's a, a system with so many um, barriers and challenges. Yeah, and, and I look this... at is biodegradability. Um, it's like, what does it look like to take uh, natural fibers that are biodegradable once they get to that, they're not really recycled and really have, comp you know, take them to the composting places? Yeah, we're actually uh, looking into that. How can we bring uh, compostability for 100% cotton materials and, and really make that consumers are composting now and cotton is compostable. We're actually, we're actually really looking at that. And I think it's important to zoom back out and say, what is the life cycle assessment of composting or, you know, the alternatives of end of life and what we do with them and really do what is most sustainable in terms, particularly of climate change. But we do have to really look at this with a critical eye to understand what is most beneficial, not just assume that circularity is the silver bullet, because sometimes it can be helpful. Sometimes it's not going to get us where we need to go. Right. So um, there's one more thing that I want to make sure that we cover. And um, actually, Helen, I know you had some thoughts on this. I just want to, um, I know a lot of people are here because they use HIG or want to use HIG or want to use it better. Um, do you, can you describe a little bit now how Solomon uses HIG and, and how designers are using it or not using it? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we use it in, in three manners. Uh, the first manner, um, which, which is the reason why we started to use the HIG, use the HIG MSI, uh, we wanted to be able to compare a score from a material to another. Um, and now we have plugged, created all of our materials, almost all of our materials into the HGMSI platform. And in the end, the idea is to be able to present these scores to, to the designers um, so that they can choose uh, the materials with lower impact before the conception of the shoe. Um, and today, I'm, I'm not sure that um, that, that the HGMSI tool is really made for that because designers want both to see the look and the texture of the material, but they also uh, want to get more and more involved into, the, the, uh, into this, uh, this challenge of uh, climate change. So uh, HGMSI can provide the score, but designers also want to, have, want to be able to see the, the textures and all, all these kind of, uh, of, uh, of things. So, and they want to touch the material. So, um, the HIG MSI is not sufficient, but we today can use it uh, to score all of, uh, of the materials that we're using. Um, the second uh, manner that we're using uh, the HIG MSI is to build our, uh, our uh, roadmap strategy uh, in sustainability. sustainability. Uh, so as an example, uh, in 2019, we started uh, taking into consideration the, the HIG MSI differentiations between a, a virgin polyester and a recycled polyester. And, and since then, we, we, trend, we really um, focused on, the recyc on recycled materials and we're gonna, we're gonna have our first product with a recycled material uh, starting fall winter 21. So um, all of our suppliers are switching to recycled materials. Um, and the last point uh, on which we're working with the Higgin SI is uh, the science-based target. Uh, so the science-based target is an uh, initiative uh, partnership uh, of uh, three organizations. I can tell you exactly which one uh, are, are part of it. 
so their role is to be able to provide clear uh, pathway to brands to lower their greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to respect uh, the, um, the Paris Agreement, uh, which, uh, which says that um, um, signing parties should evolve to maintain raising temperatures under two degrees. Uh, so, so the first step is to use the HIGMSI tool to measure our material impact. And then we're probably gonna, going to use the HIGFEM tool to, um, to measure uh, the impact considering the, the, the assembling part. And, uh, and yeah, and then we're gonna work with the, with the science-based target initiative to, to see which pathway we have to, to follow to reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions. Perfect, thank you, Helen. So now we have someone here who's an expert on how to use the MSI tool. So uh, the material sustainability index, if I have that right. So Cash, do you have uh, do you have any sort of tips for people who are watching on on sure. you know all those things that she just described and how to do them better, more accurately? Yeah. So I think. Um... You know, MSI, MSI is a database, right? I mean, MSI contains a you know, consistent view of the material or the impacts of a, a wide range of materials sort of aggregated in a really easy to use way. So it's, a, it's really a guided LCA process. Um, so it starts off with, you know, some example materials that you can just pull directly out of the database. And then it's got a number, um, you know, millions of different combinations that you can, you know, go in and customize your individual materials. So, you know, it really meets people where they are in terms of level of detail, uh, amount of information they have about any one material. Um, so certainly, you know, getting in, um, not only getting familiar with the MSI, but familiar with your own processes, your own materials, sort of understanding, you know, what are the characteristics of this material, whether it's, you know, the origin of the raw material, uh, the types of fabric formation, the types of processing and um, finishing steps. Um, and then I think the, the last thing that's really important is that it's a materials database. It, it, it contains information for materials to really understand how those materials interact in a product. You have to take that to the product level. And you know, we've said uh, several times in, in this panel, um, you know, it's really about understanding the context. And it's not about comparing one kilogram of one material to another kilogram of another material. It's about understanding how those different materials act within your product, uh, how they influence consumer behavior, their lifetime, their durability, uh, and eventually their, their end of life. So it's really important to, to remember that product context is really where you're going to get your meaningful opportunities for, for improving environmental impacts. And MSI is a strong tool to help you get there. Thanks, Cash. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to you with some of the Q&As that we're starting right now. So while we're on that topic, um, can you just describe the actual vetting process for data collection? Like, let's say, I don't know, I am a silk producer mm -hmm. and um, I wanna know, how you got to that number or sure. those particular numbers. Sure. So um, the MSI is an aggregation of database. We, we, we do use the Gabby database as our primary underlying database, which is a, one of the larger um, commercial databases, LCA databases out there. Um, and then through our team of analysts, as well as input from SAC and SAC members um, and individual manufacturers, we, we aggregate all of that data into, into our structure. Um, so there's a number of different ways that data gets into the, into the MSI. Um, so the first is it's, it's pulled directly out of databases. So these are our databases that contain peer reviewed um, and, and many times very transparent um, data sets where we can see you know, when was this data gathered, uh, how broad, how many sites did they pull data from, what's the age of this data. Um, so there's uh, you know, some different ways to assess data quality. So pulling from you know, commercially reputable databases is one, one big are way. Those, are those available to the general public or is this like a service that you have to pay for in order to access these databases? So most of the commercial databases are, um, you know, are private and and do require, um, you know, do require access licensing uh, to to get to the underlying data. Uh, however, we make as much of the meta information, so the description about the data and the data quality ratings, we make as much of that as we can 
public. And, and in many cases, uh, even the commercial database providers will provide all of the descriptive information about these individual data points uh, without actually you know, disclosing what those pieces of data are. So we try to, you know, we try to put out as much information as we can about the data that we're using for any particular uh, process. Um, you know, the databases are maintained and they're regularly updated and, and data changes as a result of that. Uh, so we always try to publish the data source and, you know, when the, the, the age of the data. Um, and then moving forward, you know, we, we try to be very open and encouraging for people to submit data. And we've, we've had some really great successes, especially around some of the new technologies with recycling in, in directly engaging with people that, that own these manufacturing processes and getting better data, fitting that into our structure. And, and there's been a number of, of manufacturers that have engaged with us um, that have led to highly, you know, improving the data quality that we have for any particular process. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we use a lot of data, um, you know, things like the Cotton Incorporated data that's, um, you know, published through one of the, the databases that we use. Um, industry associations, uh, government databases play a big role in, in all of this. Um, and so when, when we're looking for improved data or when people have questions about data, we always encourage them to, you know, help us find new data sources, either by submitting it themselves. Um, we've had several, you know, many, many um, examples of people just simply providing existing LCAs or making LCAs available to us that were, were not previously available or that are privately held. Um, and that's really the, I think the underlying strength of the system is that it is built to accept new data. It is built to improve the data. Um, and that engagement with users is really the one of the critical pieces of that. Yeah, and I just, I, I do wanna ask you, I think I asked this before, but I wanna go back to this point. So, so um, you talked a lot about manufacturers providing data, but does this disadvantage non-manufacturers, right? So, it, you know, um, Jesse was saying it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to do an LCA um, and you know, provide data. So for example, like if you're raising alpaca in Peru, do you have like, are you, do you have access to be able to provide the high level of high quality required of data to, to HIG? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a, particularly challenging example, I would say, for, for a number of reasons. One, you know, agricultural systems are, are difficult to, to, uh, to model. They're, they're complex. The interactions are complex. Um, you know, the outcomes of your model are highly dependent on any number of either controllable, controllable or non-controllable aspects. You know, Jesse mentioned earlier the, the climate, the weather, you know, when are you taking your measurements? How long are you gathering your data? So the natural systems in particular, most of the data that we see is coming from groups of producers that have have co come together uh, either through an ind industry association like cotton incorporated like copper and cotton Incor co uh, incorporated is a great example yeah. um, so really as we get to this raw material levels the, um, both uh, trade trade associations as well as governments play a, a big role in that um, but in I'm terms gonna of stop access, you there because we have a lot of people okay. <laughs> with their hands raised um, Helen what did you want to add to this? Yeah, I wanted to jump in concerning the, the LCA collection. Uh, um, we, as a brand, we propose to, to the SAC to be, to be part of the game and uh, to help manufacturers to, to, to split the, the fee of the, of the LCA because we know it has a, a cost and uh, it, it's a lot of time uh, spent on the, on, the, on the study. So I think this is something that the HIG need, needs uh, to, to dig into uh, because there, there are many, not many, but there are a few materials that we would like to use as a brand into the tool, but they're missing. And we need to find the, the LCA uh, uh, data. So we have suppliers that we work with. Uh, they're able to provide the, the LCA, but they probably don't have time to do it. Uh, so we're able to propose to, to share the fee between the brands that would be interested to use the, the materials. And, and yeah, we're also looking for, for a, a solution here. So just, just one more thing to jump in there. We do uh, help people with actually conducting LCA. So we have a service where people can submit raw data and we work with a third party reviewer to actually turn that data into LCA data. So we do have a pipeline for walking people through it. It's time consuming, um, but it is one of the most successful ways to get uh, LCA data created for your product. Great, it's so, it's so good to know that that's available. Um, Jesse, what did you wanna add to this conversation? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree uh, with a lot with what Cash was saying, but I think it's important to remember back to even if we use the best available science, the best data, you know, a good amount of resources, as we did with the cotton and corporate life cycle assessment. We started with one consultancy uh, and ran it through their models and got an answer say on climate change. And in order to get it into databases that we mentioned earlier, we had to work with another consultancy and they ran it through their model. The differences on climate change was about 30% using the same input data. So we really need to remember that this might be plus or minus 30%, if not 100%. You know, there's a large range of uncertainty in the currently the Higg index and the product module and the tools offered through the SAC don't really incorporate that in a in a way that's uh, making it available to, to users. And I think it's important to remember that while we can use these data to identify where the levers are, where we can improve our materials and our supply chain, that's available. Understanding the hot spots and, and the levers. When we start comparing and thinking about it in an absolute term, these data don't really provide that. I think it's beyond what they can functionally do at this point in time. We will improve those through time. And if we do incorporate uncertainty into these tools, that'll give us more ability to understand our decisions. But right now, um, plus or minus 30% is probably a, a rough number that most of this data would be. If we get that good, that's pretty good for this tool. Yeah. Uh, and we actually had, we had a question come in, um, speaking of time and resources, we had a question come in from one of the panelists, uh, from one of the attendees, and they just wanted to know how some of the panelists manage the time and um, they wanted, let me read it exactly. How do panelists manage the time and resources spent tracking and reporting data versus doing the actual work to reduce impact? Who wants to take that one? I can go for that. Uh, it's a really good question because I've always been an advocate of doing and not just uh, recording. Uh, so it was a real turnaround in my company when you know we were doing our 2020 goals in 2015. We had our five-year goals and one of them was that 100% of the product should be uh, verified. So that was like a total turnaround because how do you verify? Then we're like, okay, blue sign. Our suppliers tell us it's blue sign, but actually you'd have to join blue sign in order to know 100% that that was actually blue sign verified and on and on with all the different verifications that we see. So there's two things. One is right now we're in a, in a flux, like the MSI is really great. And for a small company, we would never get that kind of data, you know, access if we weren't uh, part of SAC and, and actually utilizing the MSI. But we also kind of also see that when we're doing bill of materials, when we're putting things into our system, we can't do it twice. So right now, until we kind of get the integration of MSI and our PLM system together, it's too much work. So what we see as the need in our industry is that automation. We need to automate all these activities so that we put them information into our bill of materials. We see what our sales are, consumptions, everything's in there. And then it spits out information for the textile exchange, uh, let's say the corporate fiber and material benchmark. Uh, it can maybe hit out for a biodiversity benchmark. It will utilize the information uh, when we're doing brand and retail modules. And so we, we have all this information there, also our scope three, and you know, it's a lot of work right now manually to take all our materials and try to convert that into, uh, into uh, getting our scope threes for the carbon emissions. So right now it is too much work, uh, especially for a small company. Uh, and I think actually big companies have the same issue. It's really important work though. What we have found is if you can't measure it, it's really hard to improve, you know, you're guessing. So we need to have kind of a platform and that's where the problem comes in. Even if you wanna be really sustainable, you need to kind of start to get information and stop assuming and then this is where we got stuck. And so, yes, we're uh, juggling a lot, trying to do a lot of things. And also we fight really hard to make sure that SMEs, that small companies have a voice and also that we're heard because otherwise, you know, we'll be overridden. And I think it's really important that the textile industry remembers that there's a huge amount of small members, uh, small players that make it really innovative and cool. Thank can you, I, Brad. Can I chime in? Yeah, sorry. Sure. Jeremy, go on. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I mean, the, the, thanks, Brad. I think you had a really great point in there about the fact that 
the SAC taking on the MSI and opening it up to the industry is precisely the purpose of, is, is, of um, uh, reducing the amount of effort or duplicative effort that was going on between different brands, paying different LCA consultants to do roughly the same work around understanding the environmental impacts of different types of materials. And, um, and so that's how the MSI was born. Uh, it, was, it was gifted to the SAC uh, by Nike back in eight years ago. And, and SAC has been you know, developing and sort of sharing the cost uh, for the industry of maintaining a pretty high quality database um, and, and in a pretty usable way for uh, material developers, product designers over at the brands. And, you know, if you take a step back, like uh, to your question about how much time are we spending on the uh, measurement versus the doing, um, the, we're, we're trying to do the minimum, right? But we, we uh, look at this as um, we need to have good enough data and information to have better, directionally better decision-making and uh, ultimately better outcomes, right? And so that's a, a large part of our work at the SAC and HIG and, and along with our, our uh, material uh, uh, members is, goes towards refining the data that really needs refining in order to make better decisions at the brands, right? And when you look at the volumes in the industry, you were talking about alpaca farms earlier. When you look at the volumes in the industry, the big volumes are in two fibers, right? It's cotton and polyester. Like those two fibers alone, I don't have the exact number, but I'm, I'm ready to bet that those two fibers alone are above 90% of the global volumes. And that's where we need to focus our attention in terms of bet, you know, improving the, the data quality in order to drive better outcomes. Yeah, um, I would like to chime in now. Please. <laughs> just, just to add on, um, from a manufacturer's perspective, because you guys are taking a little bit of um, the brands and retailers' perspective, but uh, when I think about manufacturer's perspective, one is the, the data and verification that the other one is doing, and I don't see a choice. Actually, we need to do both because once we verify, we need to improve somewhere, and improvement comes from integration within the, uh, within the business function. So, um, for us, MSI has really helped us as well in this sense, because once there is a unified language throughout the industry, we could actually talk to our management. Because when I talk to our management about this is the impact of our material, then they ask, "Would can we communicate this to our customers? And there is an yes, because it is actually aligned at the industry level. So with that kind of awareness and unified language, we could actually improve the, the whole company's thinking about how to measure sustainability at least some level because there is it is so fluffy for many people and you made it to some extent quantifiable so it has helped us the management like especially our board was asking for any strategic decision was it vetted through msi kind of methodology can we see the scores for example we are building a plant in thailand so main important question came from the strategy point of view is, can you give us the, the for the three scenarios they are building, can you give me the impact of MSI for these three scenarios? It was a real question. Based on that, we could at least decide at the end what energy systems we should use in order to be better than the existing materials in the MSI. So I'm just making one example, but there are so many examples within our company, how we are integrating and MSI as a unified language throughout the industry has helped us very much. Yeah, thank you. That's real. That's a really interesting example. So it's already it's already had like a quantifiable imp quantifiable impact at least on one of these factories and helping you make choices. Um, okay, so we only have a few minutes left, and actually, I want to go back to the basics a little bit. So we had a a question um, from someone, and they just wanted to know, and I think this might be for Lare, um, what is the most important for brands to focus on? And we've been talking about raw materials, but is it raw materials? Is it consumer use of materials or is it disposal of those materials? Interesting, it's gotta be for the targets we've gotta hit, it's gotta be all the above strategy. Of course, we work with, um, um, when we come into and work with the brand on what we work with them initially on what is their current portfolio of fibers and they pick the top two or three and then we map out a strategy for how they start moving along that continuum from current status quo so it doesn't matter what material it is we've got one brand right now that they are like 80 percent wool of course we're going to start with wool um and so it depends upon where they are where their portfolio mix is we start with a portfolio approach 
Let's start with two and let's track those out. And what does it look like? And then a lot of brands still don't know where their fiber is coming from. We really want them to engage with the farmers and create that more sustainable or their manufacturers, whatever that fiber is, connect with who's making it, where the source is and start creating some you know, market driven solutions for more sustainable solutions. So it is about tracking that out, making sure they have a strategy across those, you know, their core materials. And then over time, you know, you have to have a strategy across your entire portfolio. So there's a lot of work happening in cotton. There's a lot of work happening in poly. There's a lot of hap uh, work happening in the animal fibers, whether that's wool and mohair. We now have the alpaca standard. So it's, um, it's a portfolio approach. And uh, the global recycled standard is our largest adopted standard. So when it comes into, you know, making those consumer claims and value claims, uh, it is about giving confidence in the marketplace that what is in this product is actually, if it says it's organic cotton, it is organic cotton. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. Um, so we have a couple, we, I think we have, we have time for one more question. So um, anybody can jump in on this one, but it's a big one. How do you see the future of sustainability in fashion, in the fashion industry, given the challenging economic times in this past year? Who wants to close us out? I can, uh, sorry, go on. <laughs> go for it, Krishna. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think if we reflect on the pandemic and uh, how our governments are reacting are actually trying to support the industry and those, at least in Europe, uh, also we have the Build Back Better kind of um, program of more than $1.7 billion on, on actually helping the industry to um, get better. So I think, there are a lot of discussions and we actually, um, part of the policy hub, uh, there was a paper written on this about what are the best ways to actually help the industry to come out of this um, really challenging situation at the same time, be sustainable. So how do we allocate resources? What type of companies and for what type of things that we can actually give them? So I think we need to look at and sustainability would definitely play a big role in Europe in terms of allocating resources and helping the uh, industries and also companies. So I think there is a big future for companies that are actually um, focusing on sustainability, looking at the landscape of regulation. I don't want to scare people, but there is so much happening here. And, and actually that is the only way we can be more future proof in the long run. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and speaking from the cotton perspective, I think there has never been more emphasis on how do we make change on the ground and in the ground. There's more sustainability programs, the science and tools are progressing and more and more brands have committed to using preferred fibers and really taking action in the cotton space. So I think we're gonna have uh, more initiatives, more growers learning and implementing best practices. And we're gonna be quantifying the actual improvements and impacts we make and perhaps even the carbon we put in the ground into the future. I think this momentum is, is here to stay and the emphasis on climate change is only going to increase. So I want to ask Cash actually, um, do you have a final word for us? on um, how data and technology can help us get there? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's like it's like a lot of things. And I think that we recognize it earlier. You know, there's just, it seems like every day there's more and more interest, there's more and more structure, there's more and more resources being put in um, to sort of the practical exchange of this information and, and sort of getting people familiar with, um, you know, for, for example, Brad's point of, you know, how, how do we exchange this information so we're not having to enter bill of materials twice? Or how do we, how do we know that when we're passing sustainability information from one brand to the multiple retailers that it sells to, uh, that we're exchanging that information in a, in a um, clear and consistent way and that it's widely understood? Um, so, of course, the, the underlying data is, is critical and the importance of that data or the, the uh, accuracy of that data is very critical. Um, but continuing to, to put this into regular business operations, continuing to ask, how can we scale this? Uh, how do we access markets for you know uh, reliable supply of, of recycled materials? How do we how do we get our business operations to recognize all of this? So I think a lot of mainstreaming continue uh, has to continue to happen, um, and a lot of that will be building the infrastructure to to pass this data back and forth and really integrate it into business processes. Great, thank you, Cash. Vandy, 
Thank you so much, Holden. Yes, thank you for wrapping us up. And thank you to our panelists for participating in this conversation. We do not take your time and your talent and experiences for granted. And I know I've learned a lot and we've heard some really great opinions and points of view, like talking about the importance of government and policy and Brad's point about the importance of integration and automation to scale these sustainable solutions for materials. And I was thinking about, you know, Lorea's point early on about the need for holistic solutions to be successful in achieving our vision towards truly transforming an industry. So we really appreciate being able to provide this forum for conversation. And we're looking forward to more opportunities to discuss these very important issues. So stay tuned for more panels like these from the SAC and HIG. And if you like what you heard today, if you're interested in what you heard, then let us know. We're certainly open to hosting more of these kinds of conversations if you find them useful. As a reminder, really quickly, <clears throat> we'll be sharing a recording of this panel on social media, and we'll be sending up a follow-up questionnaire to those of you who registered today. We would appreciate your thoughts so that we can learn more about the issues that are important to you. And as we build a more sustainable apparel industry together, we look forward to more conversation. So thank you so much to everybody involved and have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.